Hello there ladies and gentlemen, I'm Paul TX141 Walsh, welcoming you to an all new pair of Ace in the Day gameplays for the Arcade Mode of War Thunder. To celebrate reaching our 100th review today, I thought we'd make our first ever jet aircraft review, and this is going to be featuring the P-80A5 Shooting Star. This is an American fighter aircraft coming at a tier of 5 and a battle rate in a 6.7. To provide you with a brief historical overview of the development of the P-80 Shooting Star all the way up to this sub-variant depicted on your screen, we begin thus. In May of 1943, the United States Army Air Force, the USAAF, issued a specification for a jet-powered high-altitude interceptor based around the British Halford H-1B turbojet engine, later to be known as the de Havilland Goblin. The plane had to be developed as quickly as possible in reaction to the discovery by Allied intelligence in the spring of 1943 of Germany's own ME262 project. Lockheed was tasked with designing the plane, and under the leadership of Clarence L. Kelly Johnson, went to work. Johnson submitted his design proposal for the XP-80 in June of 1943, and promised that the prototype would be ready within 180 days. It is worth noting that during the building of the prototype, which started on the 26th of June of that year, the team did not have access to the actual engine that would be integrated into the airframe and they only had access on the 141st day, the day on which the airframe had been completed. The engine then arrived from Britain and was installed in two days, meaning that the prototype was ready, having gone from paperwork to completion in a period of 143 days, well below Johnson's original target. The design included the following, tapered straight tipped wings and a single seat pressurised cockpit under a bubble canopy. The prototype was delivered to Muroc Army Airfield on the 16th of November 1943. But unfortunately, on the engine's first run-up, foreign object damage destroyed the engine, meaning that a second engine had to be delivered from Britain, delaying the project. But what really makes this intriguing is that the second engine was the only other living example of the Goblin engine, and it was taken directly from the de Havilland Vampire program, delaying that program to the success of the Shooting Star project. The plane flew for the first time then on the 8th of January 1944, to great success, with its test pilot, Milo Bircham, commenting on the high responsiveness of the plane's controls. One problem he noted however was the lack of any stall characteristics for the plane, and these were addressed by the addition of wing fillets, i.e. a rounding of the leading edge of the wing. The project now entered a second prototype stage with the XP-80A, which would be larger to incorporate the General Electric I-40, also known as the Allison J-33 engine. Starting as of the 10th of February 1944, the plane was to be armed with six 12.7mm M2 Browning machine guns based in the lower nose assembly with 300 rounds per gun. Two prototype XP-80As were produced, nicknamed Grey Ghost and Silver Ghost, and they were developed and started their test flights as of the summer of 1944. In flying the XP-80A, Bircham was to comment that the plane handled like a dog compared to the XP-80, and issues with the plane's handling were to be gradually corrected. With the 12 pre-production of YP-80As being delivered to the USAAF on the 13th of September 1944, the development of the P-80 was now to take a very dark turn. Bircham unfortunately died on the 20th of October 1944 whilst attempting to take off in a YP-80A. This was due to the plane's engine experiencing a flameout. Grey Ghost, one of the two YP-80A prototypes, was lost on the 20th of March 1945 during a test flight due to the engine's turbine blades breaking and causing the tail structure to completely fail. But what is more depressing is that the top scorer in World War II United States Army Air Force ace Richard Ira Bong was killed during a P-88 acceptance flight on the 6th of August 1945 due to a main fuel pump failure. These incidents delayed the initial delivery of the first P-80 aircraft, the initial variant being the P-80A, until July of 1945 and further delayed the plane's production and development life cycles. The first Shooting Star aircraft, the P-80A, was delivered in two variant production blocks. The P-80A-1, with 344 being built, and the P-80A-5, depicted on your screen, with 180 being built. These differed from the A-1s by having 225 gallon fuel tanks on the wingtips and an all-metal finish. Powered by an Allison J-33A-11 engine, providing 4,000 pounds of thrust, the P-80A could reach a top speed of 558 miles per hour, or 898 kilometers an hour, had a climb rate of 4,580 feet per minute, or 23.3 meters per second, and had a service ceiling of 45,000 feet, or 13,700 meters. 
The last P-80A was manufactured in December of 1946, before the model was replaced by the P-80B. Unfortunately, the P-80A was to never see combat service. And with our historical overview concluded, let us take a look at how the P-80A5 Shooting Star handles in War Thunder's arcade mode. For our first game of today, we're on the airfield domination map Kaminsk. For this and all subsequent games, we shall be using the following setup. Universal belts for our 12.7mm machine guns, reasoning being their composition of two armour piercing incendiary, two incendiary and one armour piercing incendiary tracer round works very well at bringing down light enemy fighters in a single pass, and if we do not bring them down in a single pass, we can set them and our more heavily armoured opponents, i.e. the enemy bombers, on fire and cause them to burn to death gradually. We must also consider that the tracer command available in the APIT round allows us to correct our fire very rapidly if we miss at the start of our burst. For our gun convergence we are using a 500m gun convergence as armed is based down the centre line of this aircraft, and that is standard to any plane I fly in that configuration. And for our fuel load we are taking the maximum possible, i28 minutes, in order to make it to the end of the game unscathed on fuel capacity. So we begin our analysis of the P-80A5 by considering its climb rate, and how using a more gradual angle of climb at the start we are able to conserve a good portion of our speed compared to if we used a sharper angle of 27.5 degrees which we would typically use in our prop based opponents based at this tier and battle rating. Whereby by taking an angle of 10 to 15 degrees we find that we do not drop our speed as rapidly and as a result we can keep our speed above 400 km an hour. Now 400 km an hour is a very key threshold in this plane. Below it you will find that your acceleration begins to taper off quite nastily and this puts you at a great disadvantage when going up against the greater acceleration of planes such as the Tempest Mark II, the Focke-Wulf 190D12 and the M1K2. But above 400km an hour your acceleration does not become exceptional, but it is very consistent and average, whereby you will find that the plane will build up speed very nicely and this acceleration stays with you all the way up to 825km an hour at which point it begins to taper off once again as you head towards your top speed of 900 km an hour in game. Therefore you have the ability so long as you keep above 400 km an hour to keep building up the energy state of your plane. By building up your speed initially and then going into a gradual angle of climb anywhere between 5 to 15 degrees and you can build up your altitude and your speed together. And by making sure not to drop below 400 km an hour at the start and instead leveling out and ruddering around we've been able to head off towards the edge of the map and essentially discourage our opponents from chasing after us. And having done that we can now rudder around once again and head back towards the centre of the map gradually. Instead opting to stay on the edge of the map for the time being as we now balance out our plane at 647km an hour into a gradual climb. And we can see here that whilst our altimeter is not going up in its value rapidly it will over time and very quickly we will be at 4500m altitude if not more. Sometimes you will look away from your altimeter one minute and then the next minute you'll notice that you've gained a thousand meters altitude and it really does not feel as though you have in this plane until you look at the altimeter and that is what you're witnessing here. It's a gradual plane and needs to be set up accordingly and once we're in such a position we can begin to strike back and the importance of making rudder turns high flat horizontal turns rather than making the harsh turns where you roll your plane 90 degrees and pull up on the elevator is that this enables you to conserve your speed and allows you not to risk being in a weak energy state. If when we levelled out at our climb of approximately 410 km an hour we had made a hard turn and tried to head away we could have been bounced by the likes of the Aredo 234C3 or alternatively had the Griffin Spitfire chase us down, but instead by being able to conserve our speed we kept ourselves safe. And now at a speed of 710 km an hour approximately and 4700m altitude we are in a brilliant position to start striking the enemy team as they come out of their spawn and head on the approach towards the airfield we can bounce our opponents using the cloud layer that is on offer. We are using the environment to our advantage but we would use this approach even if the cloud was not there. Now note how as we go into a dive, the ability to build up speed in the P-80A5 in a dive is exceptional, whereby our top dive speed is 1062 km an hour, and we are going to see this here, or we are going to head towards it as we attack an enemy tiger cat, ripping them apart very rapidly by taking off their right hand wingtip and picking up our first kill. At this point we can use the short distance climb abilities of the P-80A5 to our advantage, whereby coming out of a dive at in excess of 900km an hour speed, you can rebuild your altitude position very rapidly at the cost of your kinetic energy. But at all points, notice how we try to make sure we level out of our climb, i.e. our burst climb, before our speed drops below 400km an hour as a minimum. We want to stay safe and reset ourselves for the next pass. 
Therefore notice how we are not rushing to get in that second pass. And even if we did have multiple opponents trying to climb up after us and stalling out in our wake, we would not try to rush in to get the next kill. As if we did not give ourselves the time to reset after each pass, we will be ripped apart accordingly because our opponents and their props will have the better acceleration over short distances and at lower speeds, which we have articulated previously. But now having rebuilt our position, we go in once more, and we notice the line of opponents all heading towards the airfield, so we're going to start with a P-51D Mustang. We come in fast here, again using our ability to build up speed in a dive to our advantage, and knock them out. We then carry through, picking on an I-185 underneath us here, they are unaware of our presence, and we cut them apart, picking up kill number 3, and then we swing up on a Focke 190 A5, hoping to clip their tail, and we get a couple of hits in, but nothing to cause a critical hit. We break up at this point, again using the burst climb rate of the PATA5 to our advantage, but we clock onto a Tempest which has made its way out of spawn, is at roughly 2,500 meters altitude, and is now accelerating in level flight. We are reacting to this by heading away and conserving our speed. Because what is interesting is, if you go into a dive and then level out in the PATA5, you will not bleed off your speed compared to how you would in a prop. This is something you have to get used to in jet aircraft in general. These planes have the ability to retain their speed much more easily when coming out of a dive compared to a prop. And this means we're able to build up our speed to in excess of 640 km an hour already after going through another boom and zoom pass. And note here how we've been able to dissuade the Tempest from coming after us because we pulled enough distance in order to manage the situation and we actually pulled them onto one of our allies. Now, making our way back towards the enemy's approach line, we have rebuilt our speed, and perhaps we now need to talk about the handling characteristics of the PATA-5, especially with regards to high speed dives. Your ideal handling range, as we notice a B7A2 and we try to climb over them, is from 400 to 700 km an hour. Now below 400 km an hour you will find that the control surfaces still respond, but they feel incredibly limp in all three domains, are your rudder, your ailerons and your elevator. As though when you try to make an input, especially as you go below 300 km an hour, nothing happens. And this is because you are starting to feel your stall characteristics at 300 km an hour, whereby your stall speed is a very low for this battery rate in tier 130 km an hour, but your stall characteristics come in very early. Again, a reason why we want to stick above that 400 km an hour threshold. And when you go into a dive, all three control domains begin to lock up in excess of 800 km an hour. You need to react to this, as by the time you hit 950 km an hour, all well, your control surfaces will be reduced to 50% of their total controllability. But by managing the engagement on a straight line here, we take apart an ME410B, picking up kill number 4, and now we carry our momentum through and depict how this plane holds its speed in a dive when we level out. We are holding a speed in excess of 950 km an hour here, and the only reason our speed drops below that threshold is because we made a gradual turn. And noticing that the Messerschmitt Y9 on the enemy team has been knocked out, we switch towards a TA152H1. And, causing them to be blindsided as they are engaged by our friendly P51, we cut them to pieces, setting them in their rear tail section on fire and taking out their tail control for what will be our ace in a day. You can very quickly converge on your opponents as they are going into another engagement and essentially interdict what is going on in the battlefield, and this allows you to get a number of surprise kills on your opponents. Now, looping over by the usage of an Immelman here, and levelling out, we can see how we managed to level out once again at 410 km an hour, always obeying that 400 km an hour threshold, and I'm going to emphasise that as that is the only way I've found you can survive in this plane, is by keeping an eye on your speed at all times. And we're heading back towards the centre of the map. We have noticed an enemy Spitfire, most likely a Griffin Spitfire, at roughly the same altitude as us. We're making our way towards the cloud layer here, but we are mindful of them. And at the same time also the Arado 234 on the enemy team. It is the C variant with the 20mm cannon firing forward, and we want to be careful to go head to head with them. And the reason being that they are the more manoeuvrable aircraft, and maintain a similar top speed to our own. So we do not want to get into an engagement with them where possible, just make a single pass, potentially ambush them as we're trying to do so right now, by coming down through the clouds. We get a rather awkward angle here, we get a couple of scratching shots, but nothing major, and we make sure not to turn with them, we just break off. We always want to try and stay away from a committed engagement. Much like against enemy props when they're stalling out behind us, such as the TA-152 underneath us right now, if they've stalled out, whether they're using a gradual angle or climb, we're not sure because of the cloud layer, but we never want to commit to a more than one versus one engagement, and when we go for a one versus one, we want to get one pass and then break off, reset the scenario, and then go back in again. Because we need to manage our energy state and our altitude state much more than our opponents do, predominantly the props. And indeed, we do not have the maneuverability to go head to head with the majority of the jet aircraft we can face, whether it be the Horton Ho 229 all the way around to the Yak 15. 
Leveling out once again, we look towards the enemy approach line and notice a Spitfire. Most likely a Griffin, once more trying to climb out towards the side, we are going to pursue. And having explained how our control surfaces lock up to 50% in the midst of a very high speed dive, you have to manage this by predicting the line of approach that your opponent is going to take, and watch how we do this here. We notice they are gradually sauntering up towards altitude, and we try to cut them off, and we do so at close range, picking up our sixth kill. So you need to be able to watch what your opponents are doing and try to predict their next motion, as in doing so you'll find that your success rate in a boom and zoom pass is going to be increased as your firepower of 6 12.7mm machine guns can seem a little bit daunting at first in boom and zoom tactics. And for our 7th and final kill here, we catch a Spitfire Griffin once again off guard here and as they try to dive away from us. We take out their tail control in our pass and predicted their motion and that is our final kill of the match as they crash into the ground. Now we're aware of the fact the Arado 234C from earlier is now pursuing us but as we have said before, we have roughly the same top speed whether it be in a dive or in level flight. So we're just going to maintain level altitude here, and now we decide to be a little bit cheeky and snap up towards them, try to go for a head to head. But this is disadvantageous for ourselves, because whilst we have a good roll rate in order to be able to snap rails away their fire, we only have the 12.7mm machine guns compared to their own 20mm cannon. So you can feel a slight firepower deficit in the PATA5 compared to what you may be used to before flying this aircraft, such as the 20mm cannon on the F8F-1B Bearcat for example, or in flying other nations, the larger calibre cannon available, such as the 30mm cannon available in the German Messerschmitt Y9G 9 g variants. But still, we make the most of what we are given here, and we just tail off an Arado 234, the one we've been discussing previously, to make sure they cannot commit to any more dogfights, at least for a significant period of time, as our team goes to the airfield to recapture it and close off the game. As we can see they do so, and it is now time, I believe, for us to take a look at the post-game stats. With our 7 kills and single assist, we are able to pick up 38,825 silver lines and 4,022 research points. Hopefully this first game has gone to show that taking a more gradual, independent approach in the PATA 5 shooting star will allow you to achieve success in it, whereby not following the beaten path of your teammates, but instead heading off towards the sides of the map and gradually building up your speed and altitude by gradual angles of climb, you will be able to set yourself up in a prime position to strike your opponents who, after a short while, may not expect to see a PATA-5 still incredibly high up in the sky as they have gone into multiple engagements and are now having to reconsider their own positions. Making sure to avoid falling below that 400km an hour speed threshold we have mentioned time and time again, but keeping your speed somewhere between 500 and 700km an hour as you go into your engagement. You'll find yourself confident when you go into your boom and zoom passes, picking on individual foes or latching onto a chain of foes that are all unaware of your presence as you chase them down. And whilst your 650 caliber machine guns may seem a little bit inadequate for such an approach, the results will come when given time and accurate shooting. We can extend this approach to those matches where you're in a battle rating 7.7 game, as whilst the jets around you will be able to outperform you, especially with regards to top speed, if you linger off to the side slightly and make sure to build up your overall speed and therefore your energy position, you'll be able to snap into engagements when your allies are engaging your opponents and pick off a couple of kills left, right and centre simply because your opponents are not going to expect to see a PATA-5 who has taken their time and measured the situation accordingly. And by taking such an approach in this match, we came 7th by comparison to the rest of our team. So now let us take our PATA-5 a little bit further, and demonstrate it in an interceptor role, what it was designed for, where we are now going to go bomber hunting, and at the same time try to harmonise a little bit with our team, rather than just be purely independent, in order to achieve results. For our final game of today, we're on the ground strike map Eastern Europe using the same setup as before. And having already specified that we were acting an interceptor slash bomber hunter role, we need to put one small condition around this, and that is we will be in the second line, not in the first line of the interceptors on our team. Now this may sound a little bit odd, as surely being an interceptor you want to be the first plane to get to altitude in order to bring down your opponents, whether they be bombers or climbing fighters. Well this is very true, but we have one issue here, and that is we do not have the engine power, especially at lower speeds in the midst of a sharp climb, in order to be able to achieve this. Now we have already outlined this compared to our prop based contemporaries in the previous match. So as a result we are going to use our allies to provide an opening screen, as they have the ability to intercept and engage the enemy team before we do. 
Instead, we will continue to use our gradual approach to head behind friendly territory and build up our overall energy state and our speed. In doing so, that means we act in the second line interceptor realm, whereby our allies have cleared the skies of the enemy threat initially. Alternatively, the enemy team has been victorious, but has been cut down somewhat, and we can clean up the rest. Another alternative approach in thinking about this is simply that over the course of a game, Typically, once your team has achieved altitude supremacy, a good number of your team may proceed to lower altitude simply because they may be bored of sitting up high, or alternatively they can see a number of juicy targets down at extremely low altitudes, i.e. the ground attacker aircraft. So you and your P-80A fire can be ready to take up the reins of the interceptor role and surprise the enemy bombers who may spawn out thinking the skies are now clear for them to level bomb, and suddenly they see a P-80A fire ready to interdict them. And we can see this coming to fruition in this match, with a friendly Bearcat, a friendly Messerschmitt Wire 9 and a friendly Tempest all heading into the fray already. Meanwhile we're just making our way behind friendly territory and continuing to build our speed and our altitude, having already hit approximately 4360 meters altitude, and our speed is quite high at the moment at 540 km an hour. We notice an enemy 2U4 and that will be our first point of interest, if we can get to it in time. Again, while the limitations in this role is, you may not find the targets coming to you as early on as you would want them to. And we're going to see that with the TU-4 as our friendly Tempest makes their way over to intercept them. But we can see how the enemy presence up high is gradually being knocked out. With the only remaining threat as we are going to see in a bit being an f 8 Bearcat all the way out in the northern corner of the map. The TU-4 is going into a stall to try and bring all their 23mm cannon turrets to bear on our Tempest, but our Tempest successfully knocks them out. So this can be a small area of frustration if the skies are clear initially, once you do get into that second line roll. It is something to be expected. But we can see how a good number of our allies who initially went for altitude have now dived down to lower altitudes. And the enemy f 8 Bearcat which we were talking about has materialised on the fringes of the map, going after our friendly B-29, and we are ready to take them on and a Horton Ho 229 which has come rushing up out of the clouds. Now to 5,400 metres altitude position and a speed heading towards 600 kilometres an hour, we are ready to go head to head with our foes. And the Bearcat is going to go head to head with our friendly Messerschmitt Wire 9 and here we're going to see that the two knock each other out. This mutual exclusivity being something we're going to rely on in our second line role. Whereby now that the skies have cleared up mostly, we can begin to take on this Horton Ho 229 without any interruptions. We decide because we have the overall speed and altitude position on them to just go above them. As whilst their stall speed may be low, I cannot confirm that at the moment but I'd expect that because their plane is essentially a wing, we decide to loop over the top and use a limited amount of air brake here, which is readily available, to essentially cut our loop in half. This enables us to come down a little bit earlier on the Horton Ho as they prove evasive, but we can strike them with a couple of hits. And unfortunately here, whilst we do appear to strike while they're two engines, it is not enough. So we decide just to redo our loop at this point and cause the Horton Ho 229 to follow us once more. We're relying on the fact that we've built up enough energy in our dive to essentially cause them to stall out even when they try to fire some 30mm cannon rounds at us to try and catch us in our loop. We do so successfully and at this point having stalled them out, we see that a friendly f 8 Bearcat comes in to pick up the kill and we get the assist. And this means that the p 8 fire shooting star can work very well when in harmony with a friendly squad mate. The reason being that you can cause your opponents to stall out as they try to chase after your jet aircraft and a friendly prop or another jet can rip the opponents apart accordingly. And here we go once more on a Fockel 490 A5. We get a couple of hits but our accuracy at this point is a little bit poor. And we decide to carry our momentum through here, conserving our speed in that gradual dive to attack an enemy B-17. We sprinkle towards them at long range, not getting many hits, but as we get in close here we can really put the rounds in and taking out their tail control, we finish them off, taking off their right hand wing. Intercepts one bomb already and we have the Fockwolf 190A5 pursuing us gradually. Now we decide to go vertical here once again because we want to bait them out for our friendly Bearcat, or alternatively just stall them out, as the A5 does not have the greatest of high altitude performance and we feel confident here that we can essentially bait them into a very weak position. So we do so, present them a juicy target but their fire falls behind us. We are teasing them out at this point and as they now begin to have to level out as they're hitting their stall, our friendly Bearcat snaps in for the kill. Unfortunately we did not get the assist due to the scratching rounds we put in earlier, but not to worry. We've worked very well with our Bearcat so far and we're going to try and continue this partnership where possible. Now we see an enemy Tiger Cat off in the distance here potentially trying to get to altitude, so we're going to react to it as a friendly Sea Fury also comes up to altitude. But we decide instead, let's go for the bombers, we want to be a bomber hunter, let's go do it. So we attack a B-17 at this point and we decide to come from above towards their cockpit, while the weaker parts in the aircraft and we take out their pilot. 
and this is the ideal approach when tackling enemy bombers in the PATA-5, go from the front and towards the cockpit. Of course there will be exceptions i.e. bombers which have nose mounted armament and it is controlled by the pilot, but for the most part such as B-17s, G-18s, TU-4s etc, go for the cockpit, and come from the front where it be high or low, go for that position simply because it will be the weakest point on the aircraft, and the PATA-5 does not have the greatest durability. This plane can take quite a few machine gun calibre rounds, i.e. the 12.7mm calibre in particular, it can soak up the fire quite nicely, but 20mm cannon or higher calibre rounds will rip this plane to pieces. In particular, if they strike the central fuselage and do damage to the engine, you will very quickly find that your engine will go from being yellow, according to the damage indicator, to black and it will die out. And this is something to be very aware of when you are flying this plane in stock condition. The durability of the engine is abysmal in my experience, and you really want to avoid getting hit wherever possible. Now we're going to echo why this plane is rather durable to machine gun rounds a little bit later on, but in the meantime we've disengaged from the Tiger Cat simply because they seem to be wasting our time a little bit. They may be just heading over towards our spawn point to dive on some of our friendlies and they'll just carry the momentum through. They may be stock, that is an approach which you can use when flying a stock aircraft when you're unsure, and we're going to put that behind us. Instead we're going to take on a B-24 Liberator at this point and articulate why this plane is quite durable, i.e. our shooting star, to 12.7mm machine gun rounds. We come in in a gradual dive here with quite a bit of speed, we want to try and attack the B-24 before they can turn tail to us, and in doing so, limit the amount of guns they can have on us, and they try to stall out at this point. We get a critical hit in doing some damage to that undercarriage by the looks of things, and having noticed a P-51 in particular climb up underneath us, we are going to break round over the top of them now using our very powerful rudder. We see three targets in particular, our Bearcat takes out the P-51, we snap another K4 here, knocking them out by setting them on fire, and we try to get some scratching shots in our Focke 190A8, also doing the critical hit to them. We took out the Messerschmitt 19K and we break up towards the B24, using our sharp climb and only engaging our opponents once. Coming out of the climb here, we get onto the tail of the B24D, a very dangerous approach, but we can see how we set their right hand wing on fire and we took some hits towards our central fuselage, not to the engine fortunately, although it would seem as though we've taken some hits to the engine according to the damage indicator. Perhaps we've just taken hits to the canopy around it. We can soak up machine gun fire quite nicely, but we cannot soak up cannon fire. And that means when tailing bombers with machine guns in their rear face and turrets, we can be a little bit more adventurous. So we've taken out the B-24, and we're just looking below us to see what other threats are going to appear. And now we must come onto the controllability of this plane, in terms of how the control surfaces stack up against each other. The most powerful control surface on this plane, in my opinion, is the rudder simply because as we saw when we dove down on the P-51 Mustang and carried through on the Messerschmitt 19 k 4 and the Focke 190 a 8 as we cause another Focke 190, not sure if it's the one from before, to stall out beneath us, the rudder is very powerful, and once again here we use our air brake to cut our loop slightly and come down a little bit faster. The rudder allows you to make some very tight turns and snap onto opponents for stalling out underneath you, or as we saw against that Focke 190 a 5 from earlier, bait them out to stall out when they try to get a clear shot on you. And here we just break past the Focke 190 because we do not want to take the risk above the enemy spawn of having enemy planes climb up out of the clouds towards us and catch us by surprise. The roll rate of this aircraft is very good as well, but because it is so high it can make this plane very unstable, especially below that 400km an hour speed threshold. You can use your roll rate to snap onto targets as they become evasive or snap between two targets in close proximity, so that always works to your advantage. And your elevator is the weakest of the three control surfaces whereby it can feel a little bit heavy sometimes at higher speeds as you head above 700 km an hour in particular and that can cost you the ability to get a clean shot on target. But it did not there as we caught that Focke 190 by surprise, set them on fire and we've picked up our ace in a day. So you do have quite a balance of control surfaces in general as we escape the likes of the Messerschmitt 19G behind us by using our ability to retain a good amount of speed in level flight when coming out of a dive. So technically we could say that the control surfaces are balanced in a way that one does not have an advantage over the other but it really does feel as though the rudder is what carries this plane forward and the ailerons back it up, and the elevator is more of an afterthought and just allows you to get the final shots on target. As we make our way away here, we decide not to try and engage any more foes because of the flak fire around us, but simply live out the rest of the game. And as we can see, the game ends, and it's time for us to take a look at the post-game stats.
With our 5 kills and 2 assists, we're able to pick up 32,590 silver lions and 3,812 research points. So how can one defeat the P-80A5 shooting star in a given matchup? Well, if you're flying a propeller-driven aircraft, I would recommend that you try to shut this plane down as it is gradually trying to build up its energy state, or alternatively, when it is coming out of a boom and zoom pass and trying to loop over on top of an opponent, or trying to reset its position. Reason being, this plane takes time to get into a position of advantage, and you need to deny that. Confront the P-80 before it can reset its position and force it into a turn fight. Just be wary of engaging it in a head-on pass simply because of the extended range of the 50 caliber machine guns it possesses. And if you can deny its ability to reset, the P-80 pilot is going to struggle. And more so if you can catch them at low altitudes, i.e. 3000 meters or less, they will not have the room to dive away from you and get up to their maximum dive speed. And we can extend this need to engage the P-80 in a potential turn fight when flying other jet aircraft at its battle rating and tier, or around it whereby the P-80A5 possesses one of the widest turn circles of the jet aircraft available, and you'll be able to shut it down in a turn fight or one based around manoeuvrability quite rapidly. But by avoiding these two circumstances today, we're able to come forth by comparison with the rest of our team in this second match, employing the P-80A5 in our intended bomber hunter slash interceptor role. To conclude, with its balanced overall control surfaces, moderate engine power, both in terms of the straight line and climb performance, and its adequate firepower with the 650 caliber machine guns, the P-80A5 may feel very different from the prop-based aircraft that you have flown in the past, but with the gradual approach it encourages, it provides a great welcome to the jet age. And so I've been TX141, and if you've enjoyed this video why not leave a like, comment or subscribe for future War Thunder videos on my channel. But until next time ladies and gentlemen, take care, and good luck in the skies!